All right, my best friend came to visit me today, and he's been giving me feedback on my YouTube channel, and he said, you know, instead of trying to keep them all short and sweet, maybe do a longer format video where you walk through a machine from beginning to end, because people are at different levels in terms of a knowledge and skill and interest, and so this one's for you, Slav, and um, we'll see how many thumbs up and thumbs down I get, and if anyone's interested in these longer format videos, so... Um, I'm just going to leave the thing running and I'm going to show you how I approach and clean and rebuild a carburetor from start to finish. So uh, one of my repeat customers brought me this machine. His complaint was fairly subjective. He basically said it runs, it starts, but it just doesn't seem like it blows like it used to. And um, that's kind of a subjective complaint. Uh, it's, it's, it's more nuanced than doesn't start, you know or leaks fuel or something like that. So I started it up and I don't own this machine and I've not worked on tons of them, although I've worked on some. And, and so it's it doesn't necessarily have a problem that immediately jumps out to me. But when I was at Wide Open Throttle, I could hear it force stroking. And so you might be tempted to just tune the carburetor and lean it out a little bit, uh, but it's force stroking for a reason. And that's probably related to something with the carburetor. Now. Off camera, and I'm not going to show this, I did remove the muffler deflector, and underneath that is a screen called the spark arrestor, and those can get plugged up with soot, and it wasn't. Uh, so I already checked that, but that's something I would check. The other thing that I would check, uh, although it doesn't cause a rich condition, it is something I would just generally check. Take a tool like that, a long hook, or make one. Don't buy a snap on one. You don't need one but reach in there and grab the fuel line and bring out the fuel filter. Now this fuel filter uh, is like 90% clean. You can see a little bit of darkening and discoloration on this side, but based on this complaint, I know that that's not causing the problem. Uh, a, a plugged fuel filter also doesn't cause a rich condition. It causes a lean condition, and lean does not cause uh, force stroking. That would be more rich, but it's nice to be thorough. The other thing that's nice is you want to lay your eyes on what good machines look like, good fuel filters look like, good air filters look like. So when you see a bad one, you recognize it. That's actually one of the most valuable things you can do when you start working on stuff is get familiar with what good looks like. So there's the air filter. That looks perfectly fine. A little bit of grit in there, but nothing to cause a complaint. All right. T27. You can use T25 too if you want. That comes out. There's the carb. There's the gasket. Now you just got to get the fuel lines off. Uh, the best way, you, you basically don't want to, and you almost can't, pull fuel lines off. Because as you pull, it actually creates like a Chinese finger trap sort of mechanism. And it actually makes them harder to get out, off and you can stretch them. So what you normally want to do, unless you're replacing them and you want to just cut them is, um, you can sort of twist and rotate them uh, to loosen them up. If that doesn't work, you can take a slot, uh, slotted screwdriver and you can kind of just push them off. You basically always want to try and push off fuel lines. Now at the end here, you can, once the suction is broken, you can pull them off, but in the beginning. And you want to take note if these fuel lines will be easily reversible. In other words, is it going to be easy for you to make the mistake of uh, mixing them up or not? In this case, it'd be really hard because they're so far away from each other. So there's the carb. The outside is really dirty, but that's not necessarily any indication of what's going on inside. So I'm going to bring you in. I'm going to, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of this customer's gas and dump it into this little bucket that I like to use for cleaning carbs and things like that. I'll often, if I, if I am suspect about the quality of the customer's fuel, I'll just drain it and use it as a cleaning solvent for the next couple jobs and just replace it for them. In this case, I know this guy really well. I probably fixed 15 machines for him, so I'm not worried about um, the gas being stale. I, I know that he keeps an eye on that, and, and I know that's not a problem for him. So, All right, so now we got the carb off. Now what I often do, you've probably all seen these 
little brushes. I like these. Uh, I'll normally keep a long one and then I'll also trim one with some scissors so that the bristles aren't quite so flimsy. Uh, this one's kind of getting beat up, but I like them when they're a little shorter, they're a little more stiff. And so fuel, gasoline is like the best and cheapest solvent you can find. I know people think that gasoline is expensive, but the truth is compared to something like lacquer thinner, which is 20 bucks a gallon, it's cheap. So anyway, so basically just a little dunk like that. The carb is clean. Sometimes I'll get in there and, oh, I'm sorry, I'm off camera. Sometimes I'll get in there and I'll scrub like that, but in this case, I don't really even need to. It just came off real easy. Leaf blower carburetors, leaf blower carburetors and weed whacker carburetors don't get that filthy because um, the carburetor is quite far away from the mess. Chainsaws, they get filthy. Lawnmowers are filthy. Um, but like snow blowers, they don't even put air filters on snow blowers because uh, when you're using a snow blower, there's snow everywhere. And when there's snow everywhere, there's not dust everywhere. All right, so you always just want to take a look um, at where the fuel nozzle's coming out because it, basically the design will allow you to reinstall this piece 180 degrees. So I just take a quick note, you got both fuel connections on the same side of the carb. All right, the bulb feels fine to me, so there's nothing to worry about, it's not cracked. Um, sometimes there's another screw here and this won't come off until you get that screw out. So that, that can kind of trip you up if you're just used to the four screws. But in this case, there's not. And uh, this looks okay. I mean, it looks like there's a little bit of contamination in there. Nothing that screams at me that there's a problem. There's your metering diaphragm. You always see the metering diaphragm before you see the gasket. And you always see the little disc and not the big disc. All right, so we'll just, okay, in this case, the gasket came with the diaphragm when you picked it up. And you wanna listen for how this sounds. So as you move this back and forth, you can't hear anything, which is good. This is a really bad one. And when you move it inside and out, you get a crinkle. This thing is useless and it'll cause all sorts of problems. When you're replacing these, you also wanna pay attention to if your replacement part has this nib or not. So if I hold it this way, you can see that there's a raised nib. And on this one, there's not. And so sometimes you'll have ones where they physically match up, like this one, more or less. But you're missing the nib, and so you want to make sure you don't do that. And if you ever uh, get these parts separated, there's actually a diaphragm and a gasket here. And you're wondering which goes first. The gasket always goes on the carb body, then the metering diaphragm, always. And the big disc is always down, always. No exceptions. Okay, so this side of the carb looks pretty normal. I don't see any major issues with debris. What we'll do real quick is we'll take a look. This is a Walboro WTA. So sorry, I don't know if you saw that Walboro WTA. So I'm gonna grab my Walboro gauge and you look around till you find the WTA. And it's right here. And so what that means is you put these outer legs on the outer body here. And then your metering lever, which is this guy right here. Basically, that little part that your metering diaphragm touches is supposed to be flush with this middle leg. So some of them are just flat across the top like that. Some of them are like this with this nib. This one is, is like this. And so that looks good. It's a really tight fit. So the metering lever is not out of adjustment. All right, then I'll flip to the other side, see what's going on in here. One big screw. Pop him off. So I can see a little bit of contamination and discoloration in here. Not much. I mean, this is not a filthy carb, that's for sure. Here's your uh, diaphragm and gasket. And this one is the opposite. The, the diaphragm always sits against the carb body. And the reason that 
you should know that. Well, the reason you should know is so you reassemble it. The, the reminder, so that you'll never forget that, is that this and this, those are two valves. Those are little tiny flaps that sit against these two holes, the inlet and the outlet. And the way that this works is basically this area here is a diaphragm. Every time the engine spins over, this thing flutters. And that fluttering can be used to create a pumping action of sorts. Now, a pumping action of sorts isn't useful if you can't direct it. In other words, if, if you're pumping in and out, then the gasoline would just go back and forth in the fuel line. What you need is you need a gatekeeper to basically open the gate, let the fuel in, close the gate. And that's what these little flaps are right here, right here and here. They basically open and close. They're, you basically think of them as like an intake and exhaust valve, not on an engine, but on a carb. Well, that's interesting. This is uh, not really spring-loaded anymore. Wonder what happened there. That's odd. Normally these spring close. So that might be an indicator that someone was in here before. I've worked on this machine before, but not on the carb. So that's odd. And, and so whenever you run across things like that, you want to think, okay, maybe someone was in here. Maybe they did something. And there's a big difference between looking for someone having been in here and done something wrong, like maybe left a piece out, versus someone who's been in, uh, versus something that's like worn out. So um, you're kind of dealing with a different set of failure modes. So in the metering lever system, you basically always have five parts. You have the needle, the pivot shaft, the lever, the hold down screw, and the spring. I can't think of any exceptions. And one of the things that can happen is this little guy can get worn out. The tip of that needle is basically rubber and it can get grooves in it or it can get contaminated and then it won't seal. And so one of the tests you can do that I didn't do, but I can do at the end, is you can take a vacuum gauge or pressure gauge and you can put pressure and vacuum into, this, into the, um, the inlet, not the outlet, but the inlet and see if it holds 10 PSI. All right, now I'm just seeing there's a little flake of metal right there. I don't know if you saw it jump off. Yeah, you can see it on the screwdriver. So that's not good. Although I didn't see where it came from. And you can see right here, there's a little brass housing pushed in and it's, it's not showing up on camera, but there's a little check valve in there. And the check valve is basically a little tiny piece of rubber that basically flutters back and forth. So, all right, so I'm not seeing any wildly obvious concerns here yet. Now we're going to take out these jets or adjustment screws. Uh, you have a high and a low for high speed and low speed. Let me just grab the tool for that. I'll be back in a second. So this is where you need these carburetor screws. Excuse me, carburetor. I'm just trying to get it to seat here, actually, first. Oh, you know what? I think I grabbed the wrong one. Yeah, so there's, sorry, there's a, there's a small Pac-Man and a small D. This is the D. I wasn't, I don't normally do this stuff while filming. Okay, and then this one, these are cheap, and they don't work that well. And actually, this shaft is so thick that it doesn't want to fit in there. And that's why I have a second one that I've, I've modified. I basically ground down the outside of this for such situations. So let's see if we can get this out. Now, it's a good practice, instead of reversing this, to tighten it and count the number of revolutions so that you can reseat it later. And I didn't do that because I don't really care what the settings were at because I'm going to tune it on my own. There's nothing there that really looks too bad. One thing that I always do is I oh, when I take these out, I always hold it so that the screws are closest to the top. In other words, like this, not like this, not like this, not like this, always like this. And then I just lay them out in the order that they came out. The one furthest away from me is the one that was furthest away when I hold the carb like this. Because sometimes they're identical. Sometimes they're not interchangeable at all, and you'd have to be an absolute monkey to do it wrong, but sometimes they're very similar and you can actually do them wrong. 
Okay, so now the carb body is basically totally stripped. I'm not gonna remove this, which is called a Welch plug, because I don't have a replacement. And occasionally, there can be debris trapped underneath there, although that's pretty rare. And normally, if it gets to that point, I just replace the thing. Now you also see that this there's this little plug here, and that's because of this guy right here. If you look in the throat of the carburetor, this is your wide open throttle jet. It's the jet that is connected to this high adjustment screw. And the check valve is really basically just a little tiny piece of floaty rubber, kind of like this material. And basically, if air tries to go down, it pushes against a seat, but if air tries to go this, or fuel tries to go that way, then it, it sits with these little fingers that you probably really can't see, and it, it basically functions as a one-way valve. Okay, so that's that for now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna give this all a quick cleaning. So I would say I haven't really found a smoking gun right now. Normally, I mean, I would say nine times out of 10, I would have already found a smoking gun, Some, something that's like really obviously bad. And to be honest, I didn't. And you may not either. And so what I would do, again, you may remember I said that this thing was four stroking and probably too rich. And I don't normally just take adjustment screws and change them because normally there's an underlying cause for that. And uh, just readjusting the carb is not normally a professional repair. Now, for those who are more knowledgeable about small engine repair, I'm gonna just spray these out. I, I do this pretty slow. You can see I'm not like I'm not like shoving carb spray through there at a super high rate, and that's because well I'm also I'm also almost out of this stuff. You got to be careful that you don't um, put too much pressure through those ports and blow out these check valves. You can do that, and so I've seen a video from Walboro or Zam I don't remember where they show using carb spray. So there's a lot of debate that you shouldn't use carb spray, but the actual manufacturers show using it, but I would say there's wisdom in being careful because those diaphragms are fragile. And so don't go full blast on that thing. You really don't need to. Anyway, so there is something called an air leak on two strokes, which is basically, if you compare it to the engine on your car, it's basically like a crankcase leak. When a car engine would be leaking oil on the ground, these things basically leak out your air fuel mixture that came in through the carb and bring in a leaner, basically all oxygen, well, not all oxygen, but all natural air um, mixture without enough fuel. And that can create a lean condition. And that can mess with all sorts of things. Um, it can create rich or lean issues. And um, it can also mess with um, the impulse line. So basically the the line that makes the, 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 what we call the impulse line from the engine that makes this thing flutter. And one of the signs that you have an air leak is what we call like tunability problems, where basically it's very hard to tune the carb. In other words, you tune the carb and things seem to be running well, but then it seems to go out of tune and tuning the carb again seems to fix it. And so you're always kind of changing the tune on the carb. When you have those tunability issues, that is often not always, but often a sign that um, you have an air leak and that's a more severe issue. And I do know how to test for that and I can test for that. Um, I don't often. I, I, uh, I know some small engine shops would say you should do it every time no matter what. I, I think that's a bit over the top. You can debate below in the comments if you like, but I'm mostly working on residential stuff and I'm also trying to keep the costs down for everybody. And so um, I don't do, like some shops are basically trying to cover their butts, right? Like they're, they're trying to make sure that they don't overlook anything because they don't want a customer saying, yeah, I took it to the shop and they missed this. And so what they'll do is they'll come up with a predetermined amount of tests that they do no matter what. And the other advantage to that is a newer technician who doesn't yet have a good sense and doesn't yet have a good idea of what's normal and abnormal you can safeguard the shop by making him always do a certain number of tests. Well, a wiser mechanic 
will do the tests that make sense. They won't just always do the same amount of tests. And so uh, what I tell people is basically follow the book as you're learning. And then as you learn and your wisdom and experience exceeds book knowledge, then go with your gut and, and do that. And I basically charge $40 a machine to fix almost anything. And, and then I charge $40 an hour above that. But most, almost all small engine stuff I can fix within about an hour um, or less. And I'm just fixing, you know, friends and family and neighborhood people and things like that. And so I'm trying to keep it on a budget. I'm trying to keep it low cost. And sometimes I eat it, you know, where... I don't finish in time and, and I don't charge them. And normally if I have to condemn a machine, basically where I say like, this is not worth fixing, I normally don't charge them either. Cause I, I don't want people in the neighborhood to be paying me money and still walking away with a broken machine. Uh, obviously a small engine repair shop can't do that and stay profitable, or at least I think they can't, uh, but I can. And, and I'm not in it to make the absolute most amount of money that I possibly can. So when I put these screws back in, I basically bottom them out, and you want to bottom them out very lightly. You don't want to crank this down. You'll destroy the seat, and so I would just use, until you get the feel of it, just use two fingers and just do it very light until it bottoms out, and then back it off a turn. That's going to, backing, bottoming out and backing them out one turn is going to get you close enough that the machine should start, and, and you know, you don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about it being so far out of adjustment that it won't start. All right. Gasket down, diaphragm up, as always. Fuel pipe is on this side. And this doesn't really matter. All right. Um, I gotta always pay attention to make sure I'm on camera here. I'm not really used to doing that and holding my hands within the frame, but I get to learn something new. All right. So just kind of push all these tools to the side. Let me grab the blower. The other thing to always remember is uh, people grab, people buy um, carburetor adjustment screwdrivers on Amazon. And when their machine starts to run bad, they go on YouTube and they do a little bit of quick reading and they try and adjust things. So, you know, this thing could be four stroking because someone jumped in here and made an adjustment. Um, so you always, gotta, you always gotta consider not just the failure at the technical level, but the failure at like the customer level. Um, I have had customers lie to me and um, I basically knew they were lying because they claimed that they had bought the machine from new. Uh, like one guy lied to me, basically he, he, I found evidence that he had changed the carburetor himself, which is fine, I don't care. But he bought a carburetor that was incompatible with the machine. And so he told me that the machine had run fine for years and years and years, and then all of a sudden it stopped running right. And it had the wrong carburetor on the machine. Like, it's, it was impossible that that actually be the issue. Absolutely impossible. And, uh, and so he must have lied to me. And, and I think they're not lying because they're bad people. They're lying because they're embarrassed. They don't want to tell you that, you know, they lost the carburetor and they couldn't put it back together or something like that. So they tried to do it themselves. You know, they, they're embarrassed. And uh, people are trying to keep their pride intact. I get it. I mean, it's still wrong. But I understand where they're coming from. And uh, I don't think I've ever been lied to maliciously. I think people are just, you know, they're a little embarrassed about problems that they caused. And, and so they fabricate a story that will get their machine fixed without embarrassing them too much. And as a younger man, I probably did the same thing. Now, one thing I noticed, and I'm not really going to address it yet, but the fuel discharge line from the purge bulb was really uh, loose. Like, it really loosely sat on there. Now, that doesn't technically matter because you don't have to worry about air getting in from the discharge. 
but it does concern me. And it could be loose because that rubber has softened. And uh, if the rubber has softened, oh, that's odd. If the rubber has softened, then uh, it can collapse. Okay, so one other thing, I just ran the trigger to make sure I hooked everything up right. And if you look over here, you can see something's wrong because basically it's, it's pulling it, but it's not retracting. So as you may have remember a few minutes ago, I noticed something was weird with the spring and uh, something is still weird with the spring. It's not gonna cause this problem, uh, but it will cause it to stay at wide open throttle uh, or, or a higher RPM even when you let go of the trigger. So, all right, so here's what I'm gonna do. I don't wanna do a bunch of editing. Um, so I'm gonna start up this machine and see if it's fixed. And if it's fixed and it's running better after I tune it, I'm just gonna publish this video and you'll be watching it. And uh, if it needs something else and it's still not fixed, then you won't be looking at this footage anymore. So uh, you just have to take my word for it, but I'm basically gonna start it up, get it warm, and then I'm gonna tune it, uh, tune the carburetor, and we'll see if it's fixed. So if you're watching this, it's fixed. I hope you learned something. I don't know if these long format videos are interesting to anyone. Um, but if they are, give me a thumbs up. If they're not, actually, no. If they are, don't do anything. I'm not going to ask for thumbs up. But if you didn't like it, give me a thumbs down. That way I know you don't like it. And go check out Donnie Boy 73 a Canadian small engine repair guy. Really good. And I've learned a lot from him. All right, folks, take care.